Uh, yeah, I'm Peter Huala. I uh, all the things that Mark said. So I'll just dive in. Um, and today I want to talk mostly about improvements to Bitcoin scripting language. There's a bit of feedback loop here. Okay. Um, so I will mostly be talking about improvements to the Bitcoin scripting language. This is by no means an exhaustive uh, list of all the things that are going on. It is more uh, my personal focus, uh, the things I'm interested and excited in seeing happening. Um, so I will first start with some general ideas about how we should think about a scripting language, then go into two kinds of topics um, in particular, the signatures and the structure of the, of the Bitcoin scripting system and changes to that, and then conclude with some remarks about how this can be brought to production, which is a non-trivial thing. Um, much of what's going on is I, I want to uh, convince you that there are many things going on and that we need to prioritize uh, in, in how we uh, work on these things because there are engineering trade-offs. So I'll get to that in the end. So first of all, we should think about the Bitcoin scripting language as a way for specifying conditions for spending a transaction output. So Bitcoin uses a UTXO model, which has uh, significant advantages in, in terms of privacy. And so really everything that our scripting language does is specifying uh, under what conditions can you spend an output? But we want to do th that under various constraints. One of them is privacy. Uh, I, you don't want to really reveal to the world who you are or really what you were doing, which is kind of contradictory. We want to have a scripting language where you don't say what you want to do. Um, you also want to be space efficient because uh, space on the blockchain is expensive and uh, we want to be, there, there's a price to it, so everyone is incentivized to keep things as small as possible. And uh, of course, there's also the computational efficiency. We, we want things that are efficient to verify so that it is easy to run full nodes to fully audit the system. Uh, all of these concerns are related. Uh, not perfectly, but generally, if you try to reveal less about what you're doing, you'll also be saying less and using less storage, and as a result, there will be less data to verify. So all these things generally go uh, hand in hand. And an, an important concern here is to not think about a scripting language as an, a programming language that describes execution. Because we are working in this strange model where um, any time a transaction is included in the blockchain, every node in the world forever will be validating that transaction and will be executing the exact same steps and hopefully come to the exact same conclusion. And we don't want it to compute anything. I, I already know the outcome. I don't need 100,000 computers in the world to replicate this behavior. The only thing I'm trying to do is convince them that what I am doing is authorized. So it's really about um, not so much computing things, but more verifying that the computation was done correctly. And this has many similarities with, with uh, proof systems. So um, in, in the extreme, we can uh, aim for a zero knowledge uh, proof system really where uh, all, all you say is I had some condition and its hash was X and here is a proof that that condition is satisfied and nothing else. Unfortunately there are computational and other uh, difficulties right now but I, I think that should be our, our ultimate goal building things where, where we're, we're looking at things that way. So, um, specifically of the uh, improvements themselves I want to talk about, uh, I want to 
talk about three things. One is Schnorr signatures. Um, some of you may have seen that I've recently, a couple days ago, published a draft BIP for incorporating Schnorr signatures into Bitcoin. I will be talking a bit about that. I will also be talking about signature aggregation, in particular aggregation across multiple inputs in a transaction, because this, it, they're really two separate things, uh, I believe. Um, and uh, there's the signature system and the integration, and uh, we should talk about them separately uh, in, in lots of the interest in the media on, on this topic. The two are easily conflated. So. And then third, I also want to talk about um, uh, signature hashing, uh, because there's a number of developments there as well. So first of all, uh, Schnorr signatures. Um, Schnorr signatures are really the prototypical uh, digital signature system. They've been around for a long time, uh, building on the discrete logarithm problem. So this is the same security assumption as ECDSA has, and the two have an interesting history where uh, DSA, the predecessor to, to ECDSA, was really created as a way to avoid the patent that Sch Schnorr had on his signature scheme. And the, the Schnorr signature scheme is pr better in, in almost every way. Uh, there's really no reason not to use it, um, apart from the fact that due to it being patented until 2008, um, standardization focused mostly on ECDSA and uh, we, we should see if that can be improved. Um, in particular, uh, I'm not going to go into the real details of the verification equation. I'm just putting them on the slide here to show that they're very similar in, in structure. It's just rearranging the variables a bit and um, putting a hash there. And the interesting thing is Schnorr signatures have a security proof. We know that if the discrete log logarithm problem of our group is hard, in the random oracle model, there is a proof that Schnorr signatures cannot be forged. Um, no such proof exists for ECDSA, so uh, that on itself is, is a, uh, at least for theoretical uh, reasons, a, a, a nice thing to have. But as we are... Um, introducing a new signature scheme anyway, we have the opportunity to make a number of changes as well that are really unrelated to the theoret theoretical foundations of the scheme. And in particular, we can get rid of the dumb DER encoding that ECDSA has. Um, there's uh, some six, seven bytes of overhead uh, that are just, hey, an integer follows and it's that long. Here is another integer and it's that long. We just want 64 bytes, so let's just use 64 bytes. Um, another thing we can do, and much of what I'm going to be talking about later uh, will be focusing on this too, is we want batch verifiability. Um, batch verifiability means the ability to take a number of triplets of public key message and signature and uh, throwing them all at a verification equation. Uh, algorithm, and the algorithm can tell you, yep, all of them are valid or not all of them are valid. You don't learn where the faults were, if there were any, but generally in our block validation setting, we don't care about that. We care about whether a, a block is valid or not. Um, so th this seems like an almost perfect match for, for what we really want to do. So this, this uh, batch verifiability is, is an interesting property that we want to maintain. Um, so uh, a few days ago, I, I published a BIP draft that was worked together with a number of people, uh, including Greg is here, um, and uh, many other people who are, who are uh, listed there. Um, that, that accomplishes all these things. It, it's really just a signature scheme. It does not talk about how we're going to integrate that into Bitcoin. Um, I'm gonna talk about my ideas about that later, but um, so let's go on. Um, one of the most interesting properties that Schnorr signatures have, and really the reason why we started looking into them in the first place, 
uh, is the fact that they are linear. And the linearity property is that you can take, roughly speaking, it's a bit more complicated than this, but generally you can take multiple signatures um, by different keys on the same message and add them together in a certain way and the result will be a valid signature for the sum of those keys. And th this is a, a remarkable property that is really the basis for all the cool things we want to do on top of them. Um, the most obvious one is that we can uh, change how many of our multi-signature policies work. So in, in, in Bitcoin, you have the ability to have K of N signatures. There's an, an, a built-in construction to do so. And um, especially when it's N of N, so you, you have a group of people and you require all of them to sign before a particular output can be spent, that just reduces to a single signature uh, in Schnorr. Because um, roughly speaking, you just send the money to the sum of their keys and now all of them need to sign in order to be able to, to spend with this. It's a bit more complicated than that. Please don't do exactly that. Uh, th there will be specifications for how to deal with this. But uh, There are more advanced protocols that uh, do even more where you can uh, really implement any K of N policy or even further uh, any uh, monotone Boolean function over different keys. So things like this key and this key and that key or this key and that key or that key. Basically anything you can build with ands and ors over keys can be implemented though the protocol for doing so is relatively tricky. Um, the downside is also these things are not accountable. So uh, at least naively speaking if you use a protocol like this, say you use it for a two of three, um, you cannot tell from the signature which of the two signers produced it. There are other constructions for doing so and I'll talk about those later. Um, also another downside is there's an interactive key setup for anything but a simple N of N where um, you really need the, the different signers to first run a protocol among themselves um, before they can, can spend. Uh, for just N of N, we came up with a construction called Musig. Um, it was uh, co-authored by Andrew Polstra, Greg, uh, Yannick Serret, and myself, uh, which is a construction for doing this non-interactively. You just take keys, combine them, and you can send to them. Um, another advantage, and, and this is, I think, one of the more exciting things in this space is adapter signatures. Uh, so adapter signatures are a way for implementing atomic swaps that look completely like ordinary payments and they cannot even be linked together. Um, roughly how they work is um, you, you produce two multi, you, you lock your funds up on both sides. So you want to do an atomic swap between two assets on two different chains or on the same chain. Um, and uh, so you lock up both funds into a two of two multisig and then um, you produce a damaged signature for both where you prove to the other party that the amount you damage the signatures by is equal in both cases. And then as soon as you take the money, you reveal the real signature in one, they compute what the difference is between the damaged one they saw before, apply the same damage to the other side, and they can take the money. So your taking of one side of the coins is in fact what reveals the ability to the other side to take their parts. Um, and the, uh, there's a recent paper about how this construction can be used to build a full payment channel system that, that has uh, very good privacy properties. So there, there's a really cool things that can be done with this. Um, then cross input signature aggregation is there, uh, is the fact that this, this Schnorr signature construction where um, you can sign the same message uh, with multiple keys, this can be generalized to having multiple uh, 
different messages be signed by different people and still just have a single signature. And um, the ability to do so really would, uh, in theory, allow us to reduce the total number of signatures in a transaction to just one. Uh, th this has been the initial drive uh, for, for going, uh, looking into Schnorr signatures because it's such an awesome win. And uh, turns out there are many complications in, in implementing this, but th th this is really the goal uh, of, of uh, where we want to get to. In, in particular, um, it, it has an impact on how we validate transactions. Right now, uh, every input, just you run the script and out comes a true or a false, and if there's a false, the transaction is invalid. This needs to be changed to a model where signature validation or script validation really just returns true or false, but in addition returns a list of public keys, that is the set of keys that must still sign for that input. But we want to have a single signature that does all of this together, so we need a, a transaction-wide validation context rather than a transaction input-wide one. Um, another complication is, I'm gonna drink a bit. Um, yes, um, is software compatibility. So, um, the complication is that when you want different versions of software to validate the same set of inputs, uh, and there is only a single key, you sorry, a single signature, you must make sure that this signature, that they both understand that this signature is about the same set of keys. Otherwise, the signature won't be valid if, if they disagree about <laughs> who has to sign even. So any sort of new feature that gets added to the scripting language that changes the set of signers is inherently incompatible with aggregation. And uh, th this, this, is, this, isn't, uh, this is solvable, but it is something to take into account and it interacts with many things. Um, another interesting uh, development really is, is thinking about new SIG hash modes. So this is the question of when I'm signing for a transaction, what am I really signing? Uh, traditionally, this has been a modified version of the transaction with certain values blanked out, um, permitting you to choose uh, certain changes that can be still made to the transaction. So, for example, there is the um, anyone can pay flag, um, which instead of signing the full transaction, just signs the transaction as if it had only a single input, the one you are putting your signature in. And uh, this is, uh, for example, useful for crowdfunding-like constructions where you have, uh, I want to pay, but only when enough other people chip in to make this amount match. Uh, and I don't want my signature to de be dependent on them. So um, th there's a number of interesting constructions that, that have been uh, come up with this, but not all that much. And there's really only six modes. So we have to wonder, is, is, is this uh, the best way of dealing with this? And uh, recently there has been a, a proposal by Christian Decker and other SIG hash no input, um, where you sign the scripts and not the TXIDs. And um, the, the scary downside of this construction is that they're replayable. So, um, I pay to an address, you spend using SIG hash no input, now someone else for whatever reason sends to the same address, um, the receiver of uh, that send can now just uh, take the same signature, put it in a new transaction and take the new coins that were sent there. So um, th this is really something that should only be used in certain applications that can they can make sure that, that this is not a problem, but apparently they also have a f a pretty um, interesting advantages. Uh, one of them is the L2 proposal that those guys know much more about than, than I do. Um, but um, my general understanding is that th this permits payment channels that are no longer punitive. So instead of 
um, if someone broadcasts an old state and tries to you know, revert the state of, of a channel where they send money to you, uh, currently in, in uh, Lightning-like instruction, you, you just get the ability to take their coins, but you have to be watching. And uh, with L2, this can be changed to, they can still broadcast an old state and you can update and just broadcast a newer state on top of it. So it makes it into something that always does the right thing rather than needing to rely on incentives. Um, then there, there's uh, thoughts about delegation or the ability to, to verify um, signatures from the stack. Uh, there, there, there's many kinds of thinking. I'm not going to go into these things because I haven't spent all that much time myself on it. Thinking about the structure of, of scripts, uh, especially following that model of thinking about script as a verification, not an execution model, thinking less about it as a programming language and more as a verification system. Um, I'm going to go through the um, different steps and try to um, explain taproot and graft root uh, as, as the final step. So, we have to start with P2SH, which was a, a change that was made uh, in, as a soft fork in 2012, where, um, where initially the, the program, the script, was put into the script output, which means that the sender had to know what your script was. And so this was uh, changed to something where instead of putting in the output the script itself, you put the hash of the script which is, um, and then when spending it, you reveal, hey, that hash was really this script, and now, I'm, now you can run it, and here are the inputs to it. So this has a number of advantages at the time that we now perhaps take for granted. Is, uh, it means all outputs puts look identical, apart from the single key ones, where we're still using paid to pub key hashes, but I'll improve upon that later. Um, the sender doesn't need to care about what your policy is. If you happen to use a hardware wallet or some escrow service to protect your coins, the sender shouldn't need to know about that. So um, by turning it all into a hash, that, that is accomplished. Another thing is uh, it, because full nodes need to maintain the UTXO set between the time an output is created and it is spent, the only thing they now need to remember is the hash. They don't need to care about a full script. Uh, but you still reveal the full script when spending, which isn't all that great for privacy. So let's see what we can do better. Um, one of the ideas that has been around for a while is Merkleized abstract syntax trees, as it was called originally, but that's um, at least according to its original author, uh, Russell O'Connor, uh, not what we should be talking about when talking about Merkle branches today. Really, the, the observation is that most scripts you see in practice are something that is just a disjunction of a number of possibilities. You can spend if A and B sign, or if C signs and some time has passed, or D signs and A signs, uh, and some hash is revealed. Uh, pretty much everything we see today is some combination of these things. And it is sort of unfortunate that we need to reveal all possibilities. Anytime you want to spend anything, you need to reveal the complete script. Um, the observation is you can instead build a Merkle tree, so a, a hash tree where you pairwise combine different scripts together, and then in your output, you do not put the script or the hash or the script, you put the Merkle roots of uh, all the possibilities you want to permit spending. And then at spending time, you reveal the script, you reveal the path along the Merkle tree to prove that that output really contained that script and the inputs to the script. So this has a log n size in the number of possibilities, and you only need to reveal the actually taken branch. Um, so th this is a, an, an interesting 
uh, idea that has been around for a while. There have been a number of proposals, in particular by Mark Friedenbach and Johnson Lau, um, who have worked on ideas around this. But, um, I want to make an intermediate step here where uh, I want to go into what is called a unanimity branch. Um, an observation is that in almost all interactions between different parties that want to participate in a script, a smart contract, it is fine, not necessarily required, but fine to have a branch that is everybody agrees. Um, so uh, I'm modeling that here by saying, adding an additional branch to my Merkle tree, uh, which is the K on top. Um, due to Schnorr multisig, we can have the ability to have a single key that really represents a, a collection of, of signers that all agree. And um, to explain this, I wanna go into an, an, an abstraction for the blockchain called uh, the court model. Um, which is, we can think about the blockchain as a way, as a perfectly fair court that will always rule according to whatever was agreed in the contract in the first place. Um, however, the court has only limited capacity. It is, um, uh, if you think about it in the real world, hardly all disputes between any two parties ever get uh, go in front of a, a jury or a judge. Uh, the, the observation is that having the ability to go to a court is sufficient in many cases to make people behave honestly, even if they don't go there. And th there is a, a similarity here with a, a blockchain because knowing that you have the ability to publish the full script and have whatever the, the agreed upon contract was executed is enough to make people say, well, you know, we all agree we can spend the money. There, there's no need to uh, actually present the entire script. Uh, you, you, you could think about this as settling out of court where you just say, hi judge, we, we agree to settle this. And um, so that, that's what, what, how you can represent this having the single key that is everyone agrees. Uh, that was not what I wanted to do. Sorry for making you seasick. Um, However, if you, if you think about the, the, the scenario here, we want everyone to uh, agree generally. Still, what we have to publish on the chain is our key and um, the top right branch hash. So it's an additional 64 bytes that need to be revealed just for this super common case uh, that we hopefully will be taken all the time. So can we do better? And that is uh, where Taproot comes in. Uh, it's uh, something that Greg Maxwell came up with, uh, is the ability to say, um, it is based on the idea that we can use a construction called pay to contract that was originally invented, I think, by Timo Hanke in 2013, um, to tweak a public key with a script, uh, using the equation there. Um, and it has a number of properties. Namely, um, if I know the original public key and I know the script, I can compute the tweaked public key. If I know the original secret key and I know the tweak, I can compute the secret key corresponding to the tweaked public key. And if you have a tweaked public key, you cannot come up with another original key and script that has the same tweak. So it, it works like a cryptographic commitment. And the realization is we can use this to combine pay to script hash and, to, and pay to pub key into a single thing. So um, we say we make a script output, a public key that is tweaked by uh, a script. And you are permitted to spend either using the public key or the script. Um, 
But what goes on to the chain on, on, in the script pub key is, is just a public key. The way you spend the key path is just by signing with it because you knew the original private key if you were authorized to spend, you know the script so you can compute a modified secret key and just sign with it. If you wanna use the script path, if you wanna use the, the fallback strategy and actually run the full contract, um, you reveal the original public key and the script and, and everyone can verify that indeed this tweaked public key that was on the chain matches that data. Um, the awesome part in this is uh, what goes on the chain in case of a spend uh, through the key path is just a signature. You don't reveal what the script was, you don't even reveal there was a script in the first place. So this turns the unanimity branch in that we, we assumed in every contract really exists, the everyone agrees case just becomes a single signature. Uh, so now we don't have just uh, all outputs look identical. Generally we have all collaborative case inputs also be identical, which is a, an, 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 an enormous win for, for privacy. And it also interacts uh, with adapter signatures, if I uh, take a step back, because um, for those generally you still need an escape valve in case of a timeout. So you, as, as I explained before, you both put your money in a two of two multi-sig, but you wouldn't want one party to just say, nah, I'm not gonna take your money and now everything is locked up. So you, you want a fallback strategy that after some time everybody can take their money back. With, with something like Taproot, that still remains a single public key where you just hide the timeout script in a commitment uh, to the public key and in the case that everything goes as planned is just a single signature. So, um, then if we start from this assumption that uh, there exists a single key that represents the everyone agrees case, we can actually do better and, and make use of, a, of delegation. So delegation means we're, not go, we're now going to permit spending uh, by saying um, I have a signature with this top root key, the key that represents everyone involved, um, revealing the script, revealing a signature with that key on the script and the inputs to it. So this, this means there is a group of participants that represents the everyone agrees and they have the ability to delegate spending to other scripts, to other participants. Um, the, the advantage of this over a Merkle tree is uh, you can have as many spending paths as you want and they're all the same size because all you do is reveal a single uh, signature. The downside here is that it is an, an inherently interactive key setup. So um, you, you, you cannot spend as if you are part of this S1, S2, or S3, you cannot spend without having been given the signature by uh, the, the keys involved. So uh, th this may mean um, difficulty with backups, for example, because your money is lost if you lose the signature, for example. Um, there is another concept called half aggregation that Taj Drija came up with um, that lets you half aggregate um, signatures non-interactively together. It doesn't turn them into an entire single thing, but it turns them into half the size. And with that, GraphTrude actually, even for the most simple of cases, is more efficient in terms of space than a Merkle branch. But there are trade-offs. So, um, in practice, um, I, my, my impression with, with all the things going on is there's uh, a lot of ideas and we cannot focus on everything at once. And, even worse, there are, or maybe you don't call this worse, there, there, there are incentives to do everything at once. Um, in, in particular, uh, I've talked about various 
structures for how script execution should work, but you need to commit upfront on what your structure is. Right? We, we, this doesn't live in a vacuum. We need upgrade uh, mechanisms. And thankfully, we do have, uh, due to segregated witness, we have script versioning that can be used for this. But needing to reveal to the world, hey, there's this new feature and I need to use it for my script is on itself already a privacy leak. And that's sort of unfortunate. So um, we'd rather, th this is an incentive to do everything at once so you don't need to introduce multiple versions. Um, also, if you remember, signature aggregation um, does not work across software because we need to make sure that different versions of the software agree on what the keys are that sign. Uh, again, is an incentive to do more things at once. Uh, because any time a new change is introduced, they cannot be aggregated together with the old things. But unfortunately, there, there are engineering trade-offs to, to be made, I think, here, where uh, you, you, you cannot let these incentives um, drive the development of, of a system who is, um, where you need vast agreements in a community about the way to, to, uh, to go forward. So um, my initial focus here is, is Schnorr and Taproot. Uh, the reason for that is the um, ability to make every output and input in the cooperative case look identical is, is I think, an enormous win for uh, how script execution work. Um, Schnorr is necessary for that because without it, we cannot encode multiple parties into a single key. Um, and uh, having Merkle branches in there may, may is, is a relatively simple change. If you look at the consensus, if you look at the consensus changes necessary for these things, it is really remarkably small. It's in the dozens of lines uh, and, and uh, it, it looks like a lot of the complexity is really in, in explaining uh, why things are useful and, and how to use them and not so much in, in the impact on the consensus rules. But still, um, so um, yeah, th things like aggregation I think are uh, something that can be done after we've explored various options for structural improvements to the scripting language uh, once it is clearer how the, st the structure should be because we'll probably learn from the deployments as, and how these things get used in practice. So um, that is what I'll, I'm working on with a number of collaborators and we'll be hopefully proposing something soon. And that is the end of my talk. So we will have some time for questions now. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring the mic to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, one of the questions I had for you specific to Schnorr is that um, in the BIP, you, you basically publish a, a reference uh, Python not safe. Um, I'm already seeing a, a Rust implementation. Again, not safe. Um, hmm. I'm obviously very enthusiastic about Schnorr. I'd like to see people to do it. And I'm actually not finding good resources to teach people what are the processes and methods by of, which of to doing, make. Of doing this in a production ready, correct way? Correct. Is that your question? Um, yes. So um, I wonder if you had any either references or sources or so your own plans. So for that. We're, we're working on, on an implementation that does things correctly. Uh, that is constant time uh, based on libsecp. Uh, I'm rather surprised by how fast people have written implementations already. I believe it's been three days. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that's exciting. And uh, <laughs> it probably means we, sh we should uh, hurry up with, with yeah. uh, publishing implementation work. There, there, there's also a 
more on, on top because the, the BIP is just single key Schnorr, which is what you would need to integrate into a consensus system. But obviously one, one of the advantages that I talked about is all these multi-signature adapter signature constructions and we'll have uh, reference implementations for those two. Well, if you could think about it, you know, even feel free to just send random thoughts and I'll try to organize it. Of, you know, what is the kind of rigorous list of things that ought to be done, ought to be checked, places where people can learn how to do that, et cetera, because I'm not actually finding good resources for it, and you know, I, I'm not even up to speed up on that. Yep. That's good to know. Cool. <laughs> so in the, um, in the atomic swap case, uh, do you need both chain to understand Schnorr or just one? Do you need what? Both chains to understand Schnorr. Both chains. So doing an atomic swap across chains to both chains. Ah, to yes. That's a good question. Um, so the, the adapter signature based, um, do I need to, re so the, the question is, uh, and repeat me if I'm, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is if you use an adapter signature to do an ad uh, atomic swap between two chains, do both chains need to support Schnorr signatures? And the answer is no. Um, the construction works uh, as long as one of them uh, has, has Schnorr. The, um, the reason is it, it cannot, the, same, the exact same construction does not work between ECDSA and ECDSA. And, uh, the reason is that you need to be able to lock things up into a two of two multisig, uh, which is a single atomic signature, because otherwise the other party could just change their part of the signature and not reveal the correct version of the damaged one they showed you before. However, I believe in the paper that um, builds payment channels um, on, on top of these constructions, they actually come up with a way of doing this between ECDSA and ECDSA. I don't know how complex it is, but. More complex than Schnorr. Sorry, it's like, yeah, like Hyrule, but you know, like zero knowledge reads. Okay. It's, it's definitely more clear. Okay. So, say it in the mic, for you. Uh, yeah, the, the, another point too on this is that uh, Andrew has a construction that allows this to be used across different elliptic curve groups. So you, you can use this with once, system using SECP curve and something using uh, a Bernstein curve, yep. something like that as well. Yeah, you're saying for ECSA, like it's possible, it's, just, it's, just a lot, it's a lot heavier. Like, you know, for Schnorr, it's basically you just add the signature for ECSA. It's like you like encrypt a private key that they do like half a signature on, you decrypt it. It's like, it's, yeah, very, you, it's, you, it's much you, more complex. You, you, you project things into a completely different encryption system where you do things and then map it down. It, it but it, my question, I guess, is uh, for, like for cross input signal aggregation, like BN versus MUSIG, which one is like a better fit? Uh -huh. um, the the I'll, I, I I will repeat the question slower. Um, for cross input uh, uh, signature aggregation, uh, what's the better choice, Bilar and Avon or MUSIG signatures? And uh, I think the answer is in theory, there is no difference. So um, what music does is it starts from the security assumptions and, and attack model of Bellar and Avon, but reintroduces the ability to do key aggregation. So Bellar and Avon is a generalization of Schnorr signatures where you um, have multiple parties that sign a message but the result does not look like a signature for any specific given key. And for cross input aggregation, this is fine because all the public's, public keys are known to the verifier anyway. Um, so in practice, I think the answer is Bilar and Neva just because it's older, it's peer reviewed, it, it, th there are few advantages um, it's an often cited construction while music is very new. Um, but in theory, they should both work. So, uh, hi. Uh, so music, <laughs> hi Peter. Uh, so music lets us uh, non-interactively combine any N of N. Yep. 
Uh, and interactively, using you know related constructions, we could do any k of n that we desire. Right? So the, any the, any monotone k of n. So the signing is always interactively, but Correct. the key setup is non-interactive for yep. music. So for for key setup. So can I take a interactively generated k of n key and put that into an n of n music? I see no reason why not. Groovy. Um, <laughs> because the, the, the procedure for doing the K of N is where you have a, a, a number of parties that each come up with their own key and then split those into shares, distribute the shares among them, but really the sum of all the individual keys is the key the signature will look like under. And you can put that key into a music instruction again. Uh, also, you can, well, we don't have security proof for that, but you, you can do music in music in music and things like that. Cool. Are there any more first questions? Otherwise, I'll be starting to take second questions. <laughs> there was somebody before you. <laughs> so, Obviously, Schnorr has a lot of other uses. Uh, one of the biggest uses, of course, in the past was in the area of blind signatures, uh, the, the uh, you prove Brandian signatures, uh, of which there have been some critiques and such. Are there any insights or thoughts, um, but, you know, if other people you know, use this construction for uh, blind, cons you know, for blind signatures, or if you have any kind of thoughts there, since I don't think you're working on those. Uh, <laughs> I am not. I, I know there is interest, however, in the ability to do blind and partially blind signatures um, on top of Schnorr, um, but I'm not an expert okay. in that. So can you, can you talk a little bit about the implications of uh, on script of batch validation? Like, are there any modifications needed? Because I remember, like, in, in, like maybe like a year ago, we were talking about like you needed to make every single like uh, you know check sig actually check to verify. Yes. Is that still the case? Uh, as far as yeah. Know? So the <laughs> the question was uh, whether any changes are needed to the scripting system to support batch validation and. Uh, Generally, yes, because you, you cannot have um, signature checks that fail, but still per, are permitted. In, in specifically, right now, you could write a script that is a public key of mark check sig not, which means anyone can take this money except mark. Uh, and that, that, that's, of course, um, that's nonsensical. There, there, there is really no reason why you would want to write such a, a script in, in because, you know, if you don't permit this key to spend it, well, then just don't sign with it, and it's always bypassable. Um, but that construction is a problem for batch validation because um, in batch validation, you run all your your, uh, your script, out come the public keys, then you do your uh, overall check and well, what, what if Mark did sign and well, now the block is invalid. Uh, so the, the, um, uh, we, we need to f use a model where it is, I guess, statically known at execution time whether a ch any check will succeed or fail. An easy way of doing this is um, only allowing the empty signature as a failing one, uh, where you, you, you are not allowed to produce an inv put an invalid signature, uh, but you, you could just empty it, and then, then things can work. Um, generally, uh, the, the verify type of opcodes you want to use. Oh, and, and <laughs> another problem with, with, uh, with this is the current uh, check multisig execution uh, say you, you want to do a two or five, it is going to try various combinations of what key matches what signature because the current language doesn't let you specify which one uh, matches which. The, this is not compatible with batch validation either, but I think this can be improved by uh, requiring telling the opcode where 
which signature corresponds to which key because it, it's also a, a waste of execution time trying to validate various things. Wouldn't there be like incentives to start to phase out older versions because the new versions have like the better qualities being like cross infrastructure aggregation, you know, batch validation and so on, right? So it's like. So for, for cr cross input, uh, for cross input aggregation, I, I hope that the incentives to adopt it will be self sufficient as in people will want to adopt it simply because it's cheaper to use. Um, before that point, um, Yeah, I, I, I think the reality is, uh, regardless of what changes are proposed, um, adoption of these things takes a long time, and that's the reality we face, and that is fine. We're, we're you know, aiming for longer term. Have you looked at BLS type signature schemes, or are pairings still to consider immature, or uh, not probably enough? So th there, um, the extent to which these aggregation constructions can be done with pairing-based cryptography is, is far better than anything that can be done with pure elliptic curve. So, so it, it is very appealing to, to, to work on these things. Um, in, in particular, there's some uh, recent work uh, by Dan Bonet and uh, Gregory Naven and others, um, where they uh, permit even multi-signatures where you can have multiple keys that sign in as just an elliptic curve operation per key and one pairing operation for the whole thing rather than a pairing operation for each individual one. But I also think that the, the difficulty of getting something adopted in the Bitcoin ecosystem is much harder if you need to first introduce new cryptographic assumptions. And in particular, there is the, a, a counter argument to this is usually, well, but why don't you just propose having the option of, of doing both? And uh, the problem with that is, again, that it reduces your anonymity sets. So you, you're, you're now, uh, forcing people to make a choice between, oh, I want to perhaps have the, the what, what is even the advice that you give people of, of which of the two they, they should be using? So um, I think bottom line, it, it, is, it is very appealing. We should absolutely look into it, but I, I think it is something for longer term. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, just one quick question that I think you went over. Um, so for atomic swap, how can you use different curves? Uh, could you go over that again? Um, I believe it involves a proof of discrete logarithm equivalence between the two. So th there is an existing construction you can use to say that the um, ratio between two points in one curve is equal to the ratio between two points in another curve. And when you plug that in, it, it works out. That's the best I, I can explain it. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, so you mentioned that you know when you're looking at all these different elements that you talked about during the presentation, that there end up being some engineering trade-offs and you really can't do everything all at once. Um, does that come down to engineering time or is it you know other elements of kind of consensus persuasion yeah. that would have to happen? Could you just oh. discuss a little bit about you I, know, what I, the I think it, that? I it, think it's all of those things. Like uh, a, a first step in getting changes like these adopted is convincing the technical community that they're worth it and that they're safe. And if, if, if that doesn't work, you're already at a dead end, I think. So um, it, it, it's an, the engineering and review time uh, in, in convincing group of technical people is a first step, but, but 
then yes, the, 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 the real bigger picture is just the, the concern that it is much harder to get adopted. Sorry, that's going to be all of our questions. Thank you very much, Peter, for your talk.